to the Fearless Curious Soul. Goldilocks Productions presents The Deep Reading. <laughs> Connecting you to your soul show. Hi, this is Suzanne Wyman. You are speaking with, listening to The Deep Psychic, connecting you to your soul. Today I'm going to be doing a really different type of show. <sighs> so... I want you to know that today's show is a different set of answers that the universe is speaking directly to us, connecting us to our true intention and our place in the universe. <clears throat> today's story is going to be about the fact of my father. My father died, and this show is a tribute to him and everything that he did and everything that he created. If you were to look him up online, his name is Ransom, his last name is Wyman, you would see that he has himself listed as a dreamer and an innovator, and then you would see um, a number of patents. And he changed the world. He completely changed the world. It's not a name that you would know, but <clears throat> you probably come in contact with one of his inventions every single day of your life. So... Um, I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to bring my husband online, and we're going to share with you um, the memories that we have of my life with my dad and what an incredibly wonderful human being he was. So I think sometimes I sort of um, caution some of the conversation that I have because a lot of people aren't very... Uh, <sighs> not very well informed about what the process of using polymers is about in the world today. Today in the world, most of the products that are used for polymers are recycled products. They are not new products. There's new things added to them, but um, the polymer industry did recycling and reusing and repurposing other pieces of plastic uh, even before there was anybody who said that that would be a good idea. Hey, Rich, are you there? Hi, my love. How are you? Good. Really good. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. Mm. So I'm just going to give out a few facts, and then you and I are going to go to like a free-form conversation. Uh, Ransom Wyman, uh, born February 23rd, 1938, and he passed away on Friday, June 5th, in his home. So, great life, really an interesting life. So, um, today there's a surface that you walk on in uh, McDonald's, which is a safety surface, and that product is not his product, but he created the product, and then one of the people that worked with him very closely recreated the product and changed it minutely, and therein that's what we have is that safety surface. Um, the lining of trucks in California is called rhino lining. <clears throat> the lining of garages, the lining of parking structures. Oh, I know, it's really exciting stuff. <laughs> but he got involved in road repair, and after the earthquake of 1989 in uh, San Francisco, California, uh, all of the joint connections had to be replaced. And uh, I was actually up on that bridge after the earthquake, directing traffic uh, and doing it. So it was interesting. The, the bridge was repaired and put back to use. I didn't really understand how important that bridge was until I went up later for work, and then I found, I thought, how did they manage without this bridge? It's 11 miles long, and it is the artery for that area, in and out. <clears throat> so road repair, laying down an airstrip, um, solid tires, the whole technology of solid tires. Originally, solid tires were too heavy to be effective because and by the time you created a tire that was solid that could endure the punishing circumstances where solid tires would be needed, it was too heavy and it just wasn't feasible. So um, in the 70s, my father changed that technology and created solid tires that were used for bicycles, uh, Caterpillar uh, tractors, 
uh, a lot of his products have been used to line reservoirs. It's sort of an endless sort of concept. <clears throat> okay, so there we have it. If you, um, he referred to himself as a dreamer and an inventor, and um, go ahead, Rich. I saw him. I was thinking about him last night. I saw him as in his life was a big, big experiment. If I do this and this, uh, if I do this and that, what sort of results will I get? What sort of reaction will I get? And that's the way I saw him in his life. He just he did this with uh, all the elements going on in his head, and he just sort of figured out, you know, if I do this and that, what kind of reaction will I get? That's how I saw him. Okay. So um, it is it is kind of interesting because you know I think that you you didn't you didn't meet my dad and um, spend time with him and socialize with him until later on in his life. And at that point in time, he pretty much he pretty much wasn't working. He was just um, you know I mean he was working, but not all the time. It was pretty much part time working about the time that you um, met him, and then after that. He um, he wasn't working, and you spent a, a lot of time with my dad. A lot of time. Yeah, I really enjoyed him. I, I enjoyed him very much. Do you, Do you know how he got into being a chemist? Like, what mm. was his inspiration? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> God, that's such a great question. He went to UCR, University of California, Riverside, and um, <clears throat> I have no idea. I have no idea why he chose to go into chemistry, but remember we would talk to him and we would say, well, how how do you see um, that equation with um, polymers? And Because in chemistry, polyurethanes are the ones that have the longest chained um, chemical compositions. And mm-hmm. so, <clears throat> and he would say that he saw them in his mind. And it was kind of an interesting thing because Chemistry, you have to have all sorts of understanding of chemistry in many different fields. A lot of people don't really understand that. Doctors have to have a great deal of knowledge about chemistry, pharmacists. Um, you know, we understand it in the medical world. So um, he went into chemistry and really did well at it, which was an interesting story because, you know, he was raised by two missionary parents. Um, mm-hmm. His father, father was a missionary in Central America and South America for, I believe, more than 45 years. I don't know if it was like 48 years, but it was a good portion of his life. And his wife was a missionary with him for 20 years in Peru. So um, for him to take and decide to go to college, become a chemist, and then open a business and become a polymer um, chemist was really nowhere in his family background. His brother um, is an IRS, <clears throat> an enrolled IRS agent. Um, his parents were missionaries. I mean, how, how do you come up with that? So, no, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, he did really well in chemistry, and that's when he ended up getting his degree in. So what kind of archetype do you think you'd fall under? Oh, the scientist. The scientist, huh? Yeah, the, the the scientist. He really was the individual who understood um, what happens, what are the chemical reactions, and you know how to do um, things that other people wouldn't think of doing. He could put that together and come up with a solution. So, yeah, and he, we went through the. You know, a lot of people don't realize that we went through the Great Petroleum Restriction Chapter in the seventies. I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and he changed all of his technology. Basically, it had to come out of, it could no longer be a petroleum-based um, chemistry. It had to be something completely different. So he reinvented his technology then. So, yeah, interesting. So, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I think, he, I think he lived a pretty amazing life. I mean, when you, I looked it up, and there's 118 elements in chemistry, Mm-hmm. And so I think he was going through life just looking at things with those elements going on in his head, like when he'd go buy even a piece of fruit or get some nuts or when he'd do some cooking or any kind of thing he would right. be involved with. I would think his, his brain would just be juggling all these elements and uh, trying to see how it works. 
Yeah, that's, that's a good point. He really was a great cook. He was always trying something different with cooking. Um, there were always little um, little experiments going on around the house. Um, so <clears throat> that that yeah, is was... that is an interesting point. He was thinking about about the chemistry of a given situation at all times. Um, yeah, and, and I think he, I think he, I think it was a great adventurer too. He would go out. He'd go to twelve stores to get twelve different kinds of fruit. I mean, right. he could go one place to get a mango, another place to get some grapes. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. he was. He really had he a really he was. really had a great sense of adventure. Yeah. <clears throat> Earlier in my parents' life, they spent a great deal of time traveling through Mexico. Um, mm-hmm. My dad set up a business in Monterey, Mexico, and um, they spent a lot of time uh, working in that business and everything else. They uh, their product is used in Germany and is used in different parts of Europe, and they spent a lot of time traveling in Europe. Um, so <clears throat> when his health was better, he spent a lot of time traveling and always enjoyed traveling um, and figuring out new situations. It was always, everything was just something that you figured out. So very analytical mind, a very logical process, and extremely scientific in his approach about Every single thing that he did, whether it was his daily life, like you say, finding the right ingredients in order to have, um, you know, balanced fruits and vegetables inside the house, or if it was cooking. Um, so, yeah, that, that, is, that is an interesting perspective, very interesting. I think he had a great sense of humor, too. And <laughs> I recall, I see him just, he has that, you know, that smile on his face, but I just remember him. We'd go to a restaurant, and he'd say, okay, if I say this to the waitress, let's see what happens. You know, he'd make some sort of joke or, you know, are you allowed to serve old people uh, syrup here in, in this pancake house? And let's just see what kind of reaction I would get from this person. Then he would just laugh like a crazy guy. Just go, <laughs> look at that. So I don't think, I think he was pretty fearless. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That That is really, that is really kind of an amazing point. Um but when, at one point, my parents spent a lot of time socializing with you and I inside of Cafe Tutu Tango, and um, when we were there, they would come in, and, and then they would ask the waiters, they'd say, you know, we, my dad would say, we've got a new idea, I'm going to ask the waiter what they think they should get as a tip before we start the evening, <laughs> and then at the end of the evening, we'll talk about it again and see if, that's, if they earned their tip. So... I mean, it was, and it was just like, oh my gosh! And you <laughs> never knew what entertainment for himself he was going to come up with. So it, it was not, you know, like any sort of crazy sort of thing. It was something well figured out, and he, 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 oh, always, yeah. he always knew what the answer was going to be <laughs> and how he was going to handle it. But he didn't know what other people's reaction was going to be. So, um, yeah, was yeah. a very hard working. Uh, individual, and um, so I was, I was thinking about the different things in the world that were changed as the result of his ability to imagine things differently, and before my father's invention of a certain type of polymer, they weren't able to take and make um, skateboard uh, wheels effective enough for them to be able to take and glide and move and everything else. And it was the creation of one of his polymers that set in motion a series of changes that created the skateboard wheel as we know it today. Um, Originally, his product was simply used on roller skates, but then, of course, it quickly progressed because it was just so, you know, it was just made, it made your ability to skate really rapid because up until that point, there, there was no way for those wheels to be effective. I mean, they were small and people were trying to move on them and balance on a board. So I, I always thought that was interesting. I mean, some of the simpler things um, and then some of the greater things, you know, didn't it, it moved in so many different directions, what he invented, what he created, and how he changed things. So it, it is interesting. Yeah, I think little all those skaters out there, all those skateboarders should have a poster of him in his room. Remember, it was metal, <laughs> it was metal wheels back in huh. our day. <clears throat> is that what it was? Yeah, I used to roller have uh, skateboards and they had metal metal wheels on them. 
Yeah. So that invention was was his that yeah, you know, th- like you say, you really changed the world, and people don't realize it in a day to day fashion. Like, oh, look at that! That's a that's somebody's mind putting that together, and he, and that's just like you said, it changed the world. Right. We we right. use that uh, we use that compound to re- repair uh, the chimney on our house in Fullerton. Right. And just in, I, that was the first time I saw his product at work firsthand. Right. Holy cow! Look at this stuff. It was stronger than steel. Right. And it was it was cured in less than five minutes. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, later on, later on after um, <coughs> afterwards, different people you know called me up and asked me you know about that, and I was like you know, you know call call Rockland, Rockland Systems Inc. Incorporated, and uh, you know they'll 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 get they'll get the product to you. So. He came up with a method of instantaneous uh, road repair, which is used in California at the moment. And uh, the truck, the truck traffic over our freeways just just beats them up. And, right. um, and so people, it's kind of a funny thing. Roads are very, very interesting. They're very simple in one sense, and they're very complex in another. If there's a problem in a road, there's a section of it. And if it breaks off and a truck drives over it, the piece that is broken it doesn't necessarily come out but it moves enough with the weight of the truck to smack up against the bottom of the truck and then the truckers call it in and then um caltrans is sent out to take and cut that section of the road out and put down this compound that my father invented and it takes you more time to take and close the area and set everything up because once it's poured, it's harder than steel in less than five minutes. So, so you recall the you recall the tanker truck that caught on fire on the ninety one freeway and how it right. just stalled traffic for all day and then your oh. dad's product came and repaired the road. Well they they had to first they had to take and put the fire out. And that was an interesting story. It was two thousand was it two thousand 10 or was it 2000? It had to be 2010. So it was 2010, mm-hmm. the 91 freeway, a tanker was cut off by a um, person cut in front of him. He slammed on the brakes and the weight of his load caused him to go sideways and the friction of the road caused the tanker to catch on fire and the road was burnt. And there was no way for anybody to use the road because the road had been obliterated from the heat of the tanker catching on fire. So they had to come out, close the road, scrape the road off, and then lay down a new road and then open the freeway back up. But in a sense, in any other place, that road would have been closed for days, weeks, who knows. Within Mm -hmm. six hours, that road was opened back up and people were back, back on that freeway, you know, continuing on their commute. Unbelievable. And then I always recall the story of the airstrip for the military, how you can lay down an airstrip in a short amount of time, which, you know, for military purposes, or that's pretty remarkable. So they would, they would start out, and they would, they would begin the process to lay an airstrip. And from the time they began until the time they ended was six and a half hours, and a jet would land on it. Unbelievable. So, yeah, so <clears throat> you know, it's kind of an interesting, um, interesting concept because that spongy surface that you know in public areas that are put around like a fountain or in a play area like you know McDonald's play area, um, it was a process that was re- refined through a man by the name of Lax Gupta. But originally, it was my dad was looking for a way to create a safe surface for the horses when they got out of the shower um the surface could be quite slippery and he wanted to recycle um old tires so that was the very first time that he integrated recycled um tires into the project and it's an amazing amount of recycled tires but once again that um once it's used and um it lives out its lifespan it's once again collected up and recycled again there's a lot of misinformation about what happens to plastic in the world today. And um, as far as I can tell and everything that I've seen with what my dad did in his work and what's being done in the world today, most plastic today is completely recycled. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so so we um, we use plastic, but it's completely recycled. And I, you know, I I just I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting thing. It's an interesting piece of you know misinformation that plastic is bad because. I went to Rwanda, and ever if there was ever a situation where I would have welcomed being able to use a plastic bag, it, it was there, and just being able to gather up a few things or something like that, I couldn't do it. Because you use if you're caught with a plastic bag in Rwanda, then you have to go to jail, for God's sake. <laughs> so, I mean, anyway, um, and I, I, no offense, no offense intended to, to people, but, you know, I think sometimes people don't really understand how carefully it's recycled. And how carefully we, you know, we gather up all the plastic, and then we take and we reuse it. So, and I would say to him, I say, well, what about recycling this type of plastic? And he would be like, you know, no, that that can't be recycled, you know. So, you know, <laughs> he had different opinions about all sorts of stuff. I mean, and there were informed opinions, and there were educated opinions. I mean. I always remember him drinking tap water. He goes, "There's nothing wrong with tap water." Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, I know. And we, we are very careful about that. Um, so, um, yeah, we're we're really. I think some of the stuff. I think some of the stuff needs to be changed. Um, I think other things people need to create greater awareness about it. Um, and then I think the other part of it is is that uh, we need more people like my father who said that he was a dreamer and an inventor. We need people like him to come up with solutions that work. So, um, you know, and these are the educated, trained individuals who, you know, are able to think in a way that you and I can't even imagine. I mean, we just can't even imagine. You know, I have his um, astrological you know, horoscope in the in the list of people. And one time you and I had it up there and we looked at each other and we go, who's that? I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the image of it was so radically different because you and I can look at our charts and we just go, oh, I get that one. You know, we, uh-huh. we're very familiar with looking at it, but we looked at his chart and we were like, wow. So um, he changed the world. He created a, a very different world today. Um, he solved a lot of problems. And uh, you use his products. You don't even know it. You're using them, touching them on a daily basis in some form, shape, or manner, and you're not even aware of it. So um, interesting, interesting sort of um, idea that somebody could come in and and do that and um, figure out how to do it in a way that was safe. That was the other great accomplishment is that he figured out how to do it in a way that was safe. So there, there you have it. But... Um, <clears throat> so you were going to share one of your one of your um, stories about my dad. Well, yeah, and let's see. Yeah, I just really enjoyed talking to him. It was great to go to him. If you heard like something in the world, like is this true or is that true? He would say, "No, this is this is the way it goes," because he he was a chemist, and it was interesting to talk to him. And like I say watching his brain work in a, in that fashion of balancing all these elements out. He must have lived a fascinating life when he was on top of things. Like I say, you're just, everything's chemicals. And so you look at stuff and it just must have been a pretty fascinating life to take the simplest thing and mm-hmm. break it down into its chemical elements. And then, yeah. then for, and I think for him as well, if I did this, and then that would happen. What would, what what would be the reaction? So that's my whole thing. I think he's just he always wanted to see what the reaction would be to things. So yeah. I just found that I, he must have lived a pretty amazing life. Like say I met him later in life. But what right. a what a fascinating person. Yeah, you know he applied the same concepts of chemistry uh, in all areas. So I was teaching myself how to cook at the age of twelve. And I still love to cook and bake. And he said to me, he said, he said, well, that turned out really good. Did you follow a recipe? And I said, no. And he goes, well, if you don't follow a recipe, you can't re- reproduce your results. You want to, <laughs> you want to be able to reproduce your results, you have to use a recipe. And everybody always laughs at me when I take out my measuring cups and I'm absolutely <laughs> level and you know take everything. They always go, look at that, she's measuring so accurately. But that's something that, that remained. And understanding <clears throat> chemistry is a really important part of baking. A lot of people, you know, don't really even want to challenge themselves uh, 
as far as baking is concerned because, you know, it's chemistry. It's pure chemistry. Baking is pure chemistry. Do it wrong, you don't get anything. You do it right, you get something really quite marvelous. How about his uh, fascination with music? He would go to the mm. Goodwill or the Salvation Army and pick up CDs for 25 cents or whatever it was, and he'd pick mm -hmm. up, you know, Christmas songs from Ethiopia or something like that. He's going, well, they they, rec they recorded this. There must be something on there. And he had thousands and thousands of CDs, and he'd go through them and pick out one song and put it on his computer. <laughs> but, but that was just sort of that was pretty fascinating to have that sort of interest. I know, again, he wasn't really working then, but what a way to, you know, entertain yourself and try to find something new in the world. Right, right. So... Um, he had a lot of beliefs about music, and he said that most people um, didn't listen to, you know, music that they weren't familiar with, and so that if you put the effort in to listening to music that was very different, then you'd become familiar with a lot of different genres of music, and then in that way you would become more expanded. But yes, he did have um, an amazing collection of CDs and interesting interesting um, music but yes always had music on always listened to music always set up a great sound system and had music going so yeah music was really important for him throughout my life i just remember um his time listening to music other it's like you you know you listen to the radio and you listen to sports so you listen to music for him he um that's what he did he spent a lot of time listening to music same way yeah yeah. Again, I th I think he really enjoyed life. I think he enjoyed the simplest things, which is really enjoying life. Yep. Yep. We um, definitely had a lot of um, we had a lot of good memories with him, and um, <sighs> yeah. I remember. I remember the story. I remember the story of him taking your son Randall fishing. <laughs> I know. He, he would take him out someplace and just, you know, just have fun and just, you know, go. It's a, the adventure, the, the great you know, adventure. He was really, really great with us kids when we were little. He um, kind of had a routine. He would take us out, and we'd have to, like, one time he took us out um, hunting for mussels. And this was before there were rules about that. And uh, the water was not badly polluted, or so we believed. And so we collected mussels, and then at the end of the day, you know, he stopped at a store, and he went in, and he got a, a Coke and a candy bar, and, you know, that was just not allowed, um, but that was, that was his, um, you know, and after you had that, you were exhausted for, you know, climbing on the beach for hours. That Coke and that candy bar were like, oh, my gosh. Um, you were just like you were revitalized. I now know it's a cheap sugar rush, but um, yeah, that was that was his uh, routine was to get his kids out, get us in the park, get us exercised, and um, and then load us up with sugar. Um, so yeah, he was he was really great. Always out for an adventure, always out for a drive, always willing to get out there on the road. And uh, it didn't matter whether it was Mexico, or it was Europe, it didn't matter. He was out on the road getting things done. So. But yeah, a lot of great memories. Certainly, really loved you. Um, mm -hmm. Enjoyed you. Uh, spent a lot of time with you. Um, you guys went to lunch an awful lot, and um, yeah, so a lot of good memories. Thanks. Catherine is going to come on now, and we're gonna we're gonna listen to Catherine's memories of her grandfather. And uh, you're welcome to stay, or you're welcome to go. It's up to you, Rich. Okay. Thanks, my dear. Talk to you later. Okay. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks. You're good. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <sighs> okay, let's see if we can bring Katharina on. And if she... Uh... Hi there. Hi, Katharina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Mm. Really good. Really good. So um, before we go into the conversation about your memories about my dad, what's the update on the astrology for the coming week? Oh, um, well, we're in a lot of things right now astrologically in June. We are in between the two eclipses, so we had a, a lunar eclipse on June 5th, and then we have a solar eclipse coming up on June 20th. So when we're in between that, um, we're also in this, this 
veil of Neptune where the sun and Neptune are in this 90 degree alignment. So um, kind of a call to higher consciousness and um, eliminating things that are illusions and stuff like that. And it, that veil of Neptune happens twice a year and it usually does happen when we're in between these eclipses. Huh. Um, so, so we have that. We've got five planets in retrograde starting June 17th with Mercury retrograde going into Cancer. Uh-huh. Um, and I believe we're in, no, we're still in Gemini season. So, yeah, there's a lot of activity for June. It's going to be um, kind of an interesting month, I think, as, as we've already seen. Just the first few weeks, there's been a lot of activity going on in the world. and So I think that just mm-hmm. continues through our summer of, um, you know, evolving and experiencing the energy through all these, uh, you know, planet shifts and conjunctions and retrogrades. And there's a lot going on. Oh, wow. All right. So the 17th is the beginning of Mercury retrograde. Yeah, in Cancer. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So thanks for coming and doing this with me today, Katharina. You're welcome. My pleasure. Oh, good. Okay. So I was talking with Rich about my dad. And um, dad, uh, Rich didn't meet my dad until later in life. Um, but, you know, you you have your own memories of my dad, your grandfather. So, you know, is there is there one in particular you'd like to share, a fun one, you know, or an interesting one? I mean, my, uh, my memories of going to your parents' house where I always got to play on their dime slot machine, so they always saved all their dimes for me to play on the slot machine. And he always taught me how to count my winnings, stacking my dimes into uh, stacks of 10 so I could count each dollar I had. I mean, this is when I was like five. And then um, he taught me how to play backgammon, which I I don't know how to play anymore, but um, that was my education with him of how to play backgammon and how when you gamble, you don't spend your winnings. (laughs) Good advice. Really good advice. That's good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any. But I did. Other... I did some research on him because he always mentioned all of his patents and stuff, and and you know he and I both went to UCR. So, yeah. you know, he went to UC Riverside when it first opened. I think he's one of the first graduating class um, members and getting a degree in chemistry. And so I was trying to look him up in the archives. Um, so it's kind of cool to be, uh, you know, your sister also went to UCR and then I went to UC Riverside. So it's kind of cool to be a third generation um, Highlander alumni. Um, so I always, I like that. that was always a nice connection. But um, I couldn't find anything on the UCR website, but it's funny, I found uh, a Los Angeles Times article from 1989, and I'm sure yeah. you know exactly what that date relates to right. of the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Right. Yeah, do the story. That's a good story. That's probably that's probably one of the most um important, um, well known, well publicized um situations where his product was used. So do that story. That's a good story. Yeah, so um I didn't realize that their company per call Polymerics had only been open a few weeks. And so it's interesting. In the article, they say, you know, the office doesn't even have any furniture. There's only four employees. But the first weeks, you know, it's spent um, using its patented polymer to, um, you know, fill this, this to fix this repair in the, the San Francisco Bay Bridge where the, an earthquake caused a 50-foot section um, a fifty foot section of the road to basically fall. Right. So um, I was up there on that repair, and um, it's, a two, it's, a, it's a two-level bridge. It spans more than 11 miles, and it connects uh, one side, which is Oakland, um, to the other side, which um, is part of 
Alameda. I can't remember if it goes the other way. But <clears throat> the top level um, was going into the city, and the lower level was leaving the city of San Francisco, and they had not taken and replaced and maintained the joints on the suspended section of the bridge. And when that earthquake hit, which they um, later the numbers came out that it was an 8.0 earthquake, a section of the bridge collapsed, and um, both levels did. And for us to go out to do the repair, um, we kept one car going the direction on the top level, and then there was another car on the lower level. So we never left the bridge, and the only way you could leave the bridge at the point in time that I was on it was to walk over a piece of plywood where the welding was going on. So they had to take and cut this piece of the bridge off, put it on a barge, take that out, and then have another piece manufactured and put it back in there and weld it in there. And one of the things, of course, that happened was they realized that the joints had not been correctly maintained. And so, you know, the laws and politics and so forth were that they couldn't, the company could not do the suspended and the piling supported bridge, but could only do the suspended part. But a year later, they were brought back in and they were done the part of the bridge that was on pilings, and then later they were brought in and done the Golden Gate Bridge, and that was the beginning of that part of the road repair for the company that he had. Um, But it was an amazing journey to go out there and to be on that uh, bridge uh, because that's, that's the only way you can get into that city. I mean, it's a huge problem to not have that bridge. I mean, huge. You can't even imagine. Yeah, so, I mean, that was always the the big story that we would hear around the office, and they always had pictures of that up on their company. And But it was kind of interesting to go back and look at um, the article and read the product, which was called Transfix, and how he developed it um, initially for the quick repair of Air Force runways. So right. he's quoted in an article saying the goal was to be able to restore a bombed runway within four hours of attack and that is in any weather, hot or cold, wet or dry. And the the Air Force actually tested the product at a NATO base in West Germany. So huh. um, they comment that, you know, the product that they used on the bridge worked, but it took longer than four hours. And your dad is quoted saying uh, it took four days. The crews were not properly trained. So, um, <laughs> and I thought that's just that's so him, yeah, that's, right? That's true. No, I mean, no one was really properly trained about him. He he had it all in his head most of the time, right? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's a that's a good analysis of the situation. But you know, the people that were from Caltrans. I mean, they'd, they'd never taken and applied an elastomer polymer um, solution uh, before in their life. They didn't have any training. There was no training for it. Um, and they do apply it in situations where it's wet, but they torch the ground. They take out and torch the ground and dry it first. So it does have to be spotlessly dry, and they solve that problem by using torches. So um, interesting. It is, it is probably um, Caltrans, you know, here in California, um, the desert conditions and so forth. Um, we do have mountainous conditions where there's snow and so forth, so it does work in those situations. But, yeah, it, it, it's, it's an interesting, I like that. They just, they just didn't have the right training in order to get it done on time. It wasn't anything wrong with this product, which was true. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for looking at Yeah, it was also up. kind of cool to look up his patents. I counted 17 patents and starting back from... 1975, and it seemed like in 1975 he created this product that was similar to what we would know today as fix a flat. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was uh, that was done. We were we were living in Redondo Beach, and uh, he converted our garage, the American tradition of the garage, as a area to try these products and. Uh, so the backyard had different uh, surfaces that he had used, uh, and then in the garage he would have people over and see if he could teach them how to do it. But um, it was it was basically two polymers that were brought together, and they they set up very very quickly. So 
Yes. A lot of his products were later modified or changed by other people, but he did, you know, he did the work that changed it. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So how many patents did you find? I counted 17. Huh. Okay. Anything else? Um, There there could be more out there. Um, I mean, a lot of it is a lot of, it's all his road repair and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he was trying to create deflation-proof tires, um, polymer concrete, um, I mean, mostly tires and road repair that I was able to see online, but it's kind of cool. They explain what each one um, is, so... And, uh, yeah, I mean, none of these are with, um, I always forget the name of his famous partner. You just mentioned it with Lock Rich. Gupta. Oh, yeah. Lakshmi. Yeah, Gupta. So, yeah, there's only uh, one or two on there. But, um, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was interesting to kind of see his work. I mean, he really was somebody who was really devoted to his work and always thinking of some invention and, um you know, there is always. So I never, I never heard the story about uh, him creating a lab in your guys's garage or you know experimenting in the backyard. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. You remember when they uh, lived in Calabasas? They lived in Calabasas, and uh, uh, he actually had a lab on the property there. Um, I don't know if you remember that. And then there were different situations uh, where he was trying to develop a product. One of them was he was going to create um, a waterproof concrete situation, and that was what that big um, uh, fish pond was. Uh, Did you fall in it or Randall fall in it? I can't remember who fell into this pond. I don't remember. Well, uh, they had this pond, and it was a deep pond, and my dad had created um, a concrete, and he had taken and done a coating for it, and he had a pond, and it was quite deep. You know, there was no safety around it or anything else like that. You know, who would go into a fish pond? I think it was, it wasn't you, maybe it was Randall. Randall um, went into the pond, and I was, you know, waiting to see if he was going to come back up. <laughs> so, um, to be fair, we were taught to swim from birth. I mean, we all knew how to swim very early on. We couldn't, yeah. You couldn't keep us out of the water. Right, right. And, yeah. uh yeah, it was it was my mother who who jumped in there and pulled him out. So, um, and I don't know what I was thinking when I was standing there because I was standing right there. I was thinking, well, he's going to come back up in a second here. But that's how deep the pond was. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Um, mother motherhood is filled with many imperfections. Um, so the only problem is is when the mother won't admit to them. So um, <laughs> yes, yes, they did, and there were. Um, the place where the horses were kept, that was all surfaced with one of his products. He would try something at his home first, and um, and then he would take and um, go to work on refining the process and finding an application. But originally the product that was used um, for a way for the horses to be showered and then walk out onto a safe surface was called Rubberon. And... Um, that was the, um, and that was there at their house. But you just saw it all the time, and you didn't think there was, um, you didn't think about it. And then later on, my parents took and um, had their garage um, floor surfaced, um, and that's that's one of his technologies that obviously somebody else furthered. But yeah, those are those are just some of the the applications I can think of. I, I'm sure I'm forgetting many things at this point in time, but yes, he was always learning something new. He was always trying something new, and he always experimented, you know, at his house first. Yeah, I mean, I always remember there being like uh, surfaces covered with, you know, like areas where he was working or, you know, seeing the product laid down in like you said, the garage, the driveway, I mean, um, being at their business, I mean, my play things were their little, they always had little samples of their product and Mm -hmm. you could stack them up like blocks. You know, they were done like on a little wooden square and so you could see the layering of the product and the sand in between. And I mean, when you're 
little, you're not really necessarily interested in what the product is, but it sure made something cool to build out of. So, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, and they always had a plant. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time there doing things together. So, and uh, my parents always liked taking you out to eat and seeing if they could get you to try something new. So um, do you have a fun story for our listeners today about trying an unusual food with my parents for a meal? Oh, that's true. Yeah, they did always like to go to unique restaurants, and um, I'm sure they were just burdened with a granddaughter who was the pickiest of picky eaters and, you know, would make such a fuss about trying anything. Um <laughs> But they were patient with me, and they'd order, um, you know, separate little meals for me and stuff. But, yeah, they were good about getting me to try new foods, and your dad was always had a lot of pride about going to uh, the grocery store, like the um, Middle Eastern markets and finding produce and finding different, um, just different things that you didn't really see in a normal grocery store and kind of experimenting with cooking and um but yeah, rest, finding good rest. He had a knack for finding like some hole in the wall place that was actually really nice and had like amazing food. He always did have a good knack for that. And it was never some place that was like really po- like popular online, like the locals knew it or, you know, he could, he could find that local spot that everyone knew to go to because it was fresh or, you know, tasted really amazing. But, um, yeah, he, he did. It was almost like an internal compass for that that he had. Yep, that's really true. So I was hoping you'd share the story about the Vietnamese restaurant and frog's legs. Oh, um, well, there was a lot of, uh, because I was such a picky eater, uh, there was a lot of um, persuading me to eat something. And, you know, so I was told that these frog's legs were not frog's legs, they were chicken. Uh, and it does taste like chicken, but I i mean, I remember, the only thing I think I remember was that I told everyone it tasted like really funny chicken. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, they were, you know, always always something different. Um, but he was, he was always encouraging of, like, trying new stuff, and then we'd always have, like, um, great like Persian food or Indian food on holidays and um, always like, I guess the thing that I remember with him most about food is he'd always make us fresh orange juice in the morning um, for breakfast. I always saw him at breakfast time and the newspaper was out and so there was always orange juice and fruit and um, yeah, so aside from the restaurants and stuff that we would go to. Yeah. Very, very good. Really um, great memories, um, great perspective, and um, that's that's really good. I, you know, it's so funny. I forgot to look up that story about um, his company. The doors weren't even open, and the um, Oakland Bay Bridge had to be repaired, and that was the uh, next company that he went into, the next stage of of chemistry and uh, inventions and solutions that he came up with. So, yeah, that's a good story. That's a good perspective. I forgot about that part of the story. You're right. We hear it so much and um, everything else. Uh, We don't really think about it anymore, but it was a scary time to be up in San Francisco. People, anything, anything, a, a car going by too fast and there was a tremor and people would you know, panic and look for a place to go and stand. It was a very difficult time to um, be in San Francisco. And it's only been recently that they finished up the repair in San Francisco. The federal funds that they took a loan on, they gave it to the people in their homes and um, the businesses that had suffered, and then they took care of the um, roads afterwards. So it was almost a full 20 years before they... um, One of the bridges was a two-story bridge, and it collapsed one level on top of the other one, and they never, um, they didn't haul it away for a long time. So it was an interesting process with politics and, of course, an earthquake, which, you know, you get to an, uh, an earthquake that's an eight-point earthquake, there's 
there's all sorts of structural damage that happens. That's just unavoidable. There's nothing built to withstand that, nothing. Yeah, I think the only, if I remember correctly, there was like an Oakland A's game going on at the time of the earthquake. Mm -hmm. I remember that right. But yeah, there was a bunch of, um, I mean, it was a historic event. So, I mean, I wanted to know what your experience was like working on that bridge, but um, I don't know. What's your favorite, what's your like memory that you're kind of drawn to? Well, first of all, my dad really loved Rich. And... um, so my dad took it upon himself to be the one to organize um, organize the details of our wedding. You know, um, I had been married before, so I felt that I should have a quiet wedding. But Richard's never been married. And so we got married at um, his, we were living in his parents' home at the time. And um, we got married there. And my dad, um, you know, the cake, the cookies, um, the food, all of those things he, he personally um, shopped and picked out with Rich, so that was a um, that was a remarkable memory for me, for him to um, want to be the one to put together um, these things for my wedding. Yes, it was a wonderful, wonderful memory, and he photographed the wedding too, um, and some really, really beautiful photographs. So that was a extraordinary um, gift and uh, extraordinary blessing and affirmation of his love for me. So, yes, that would be my favorite memory of my dad. Yeah, now that you're mentioning, I do remember those Italian cookies, but <laughs> fresh from the bakery. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. I, for, I mean, I it, he was just, he always had such good food that he brought around us, but it, it kind of just fades into... You know, we got used to it, but like, if you think about it, like, um, like, oh yeah, I remember those cookies. You remember the <laughs> the powdered sugar and the texture, and like, yeah. But I mean, you and I are both bakers, so like, anything pastry or baked goods, it's, you know, always kind of draws our attention. So, yeah, yeah, he was always was. good with that. Yep, he was. So um, that was really that was really nice. Um, really wonderful, and um, so yeah, he he was a very patient human being, extremely smart, uh, and he had uh, an expectation that people would be willing to be as smart as he is, and so in a lot of ways, I don't, I mean, later on in life, I think he kind of understood it, but when I was growing up, I don't think you really had much patience for people that weren't willing to struggle with their intellect in order to accomplish things. So I I think I have that same application in my thinking Um, today when I work with students. You know, why is it you're not willing to go through the struggles in order to uh, accomplish a spiritual goal? Um, So, yes, it is interesting. He... um, he was never challenged by the fact that I was he was a scientist and it was about logic and um he was an extremely um in his early uh years a conservative religious person uh, his family was nazarenes and so he never went into the conversation of um conflicting in any way with my work the only thing was is that it was always a surprise to him when it was accurate, and I don't have an explanation for that. At one point, um, I was doing um, handwriting analysis process for them, for their employees uh, in their new business, and, you know, I mean, there was no reason for me not to, um, you know, be precise because it wasn't going to go anywhere. I mean, you know, it was just for them to understand about their employees, And I was quite specific about a person, one of these people's health conditions. And he went to the person and asked them about that. And, of course, it was true. And for some reason or another, that stuck in his head that I could be quite that specific about an example of somebody having um, a health issue. Um, But, yeah, it's interesting. It was not a situation of where um, I felt as if he tested me or questioned me. He was extremely respectful, kind, and supportive about my work. And, um, yeah, yeah, it was was a very, um, it was a very good relationship for me. So, 
Yeah, that's a great question. I always, I always remember you guys having a shared love of reading. I mean, he had the most books out of anybody I knew. I mean, rooms of books, attics full of books, um, read every single one of them cover to cover, always was reading, seemed like four books at a time. And so I guess some of my earliest memories would probably be of just you guys discussing books and works of literature and um having those really intellectual discussions because you're an avid reader and, um, you know, influenced me to be an avid reader. So that's true. I don't think I would have ever, I I wouldn't, I don't think I ever would have um, studied um, Somerset mom's work if it hadn't been for him. Uh, That was one piece of work. I had read a lot of Gandhi and uh, he of course was a big, um, you know, he's a pacifist. Uh, a political pacifist and a religious pacifist. And so, uh, you know, the enjoyment of the material of Gandhi and Gandhi's accomplishments. I'm sitting here staring at a book of Gandhi on my bookcase. But, um, yeah, just definitely a great intellectual. And we did have a a shared interest in books. And uh, he recommended books, or he would find books for me. Um, Psychic books, one of the books he found for me was a book called The Reluctant Prophet by Daniel Logan. And uh, he always looked for those books and asked me if I had read different people, and then he would give me those books. And it became an interesting sort of uh, sort of reference material, and I still have all of them. So that's true. That's another really important point. And um, I do enjoy reading. It is, it is a great pastime, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I think, yeah, he always tried to share in our interests. And, I mean, they, of course, always asked about, uh, they always wanted to know what I was doing in school, which I'm sure is pretty common. But because you know, as a young person, that's kind of the only thing you have going on in your life is school. But um, they were always really supportive and and liked you know hearing me talk about my education and supported my higher education going to college. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that was always good. Great. That's really. Those are some. Those are some great reminders. Those are some good points to to bring into the story. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, any words of wisdom about this Mercury retrograde? Uh, I think we're going to understand how much um, emotions our words can convey. So really understanding our emotions around communication with one another. Um, So just, uh, I like to keep that kind of mindset of just be curious and um, interpret giving someone the benefit of the doubt. So, uh, you know, be kind, give someone the benefit of the doubt if you're not sure about what they said or not sure about their intention, it's okay to be curious and ask, and then you eliminate the miscommunication. So if you think you've understood something and you don't like what you've understood, you just simply ask the question again until you get more clarity. Yeah, or ask it in a different way. I mean, sometimes berating the same issue, uh, you know, I always like to say I, I the active the active listening, right? I heard you say this, is that what you meant? Um, or this is what that means to me. Is that is that the same thing that you are trying to convey in this situation? Excellent. Excellent Active advice. listening. Active yeah. listening. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. You're welcome to stay and listen to the wrap-up. You've been listening to Suzanne Wyman. My phone number is 714-400-7384. Um, This is the deep reading connecting you to your soul, and we'll be back next week. Have a great day. Make this day great. And thank you so much for listening. Become a Goldilocks Productions VIP patron. Receive exclusive access to live stream special and other epic perks. Join the Goldilocks Productions VIP community today.